30 verses, so a little bit longer of a chapter somewhat. I mean, last week was 30, but a lot of the ones we've been dealing with have been in the 20s. But uh, this, a lot of this verse is really <clears throat> very easy to apply, very simplistic. Um, I don't want to say nothing of depth. I mean, there's always depth in the scriptures, but um, I would, me personally, I would go along more of the milk, milk type of stuff than necessarily down in the meat of the word, but um, everyone's in different stages in their walk with the Lord, so sometimes what's milk to one may be meat to others, but nevertheless, we'll work our way, work our way through it. Uh, i trying to remember here, I was looking the other day, right before Thessalonians, or right before Colossians. Few books that pass Genesis. <laughs> it's over there, Dad, about page 1562. Where you at? Yeah. Chapter 2. Page 1562. We'll go right to the Colossians and we'll go to Thessalonians. We got a few more books Bible, a to go through. Yeah. So. All right. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. Uh, I'll read about verses 1 through 4. A lot of this chapter really will break up into bigger chunks uh, for the most part. Um, go back and cover some things, but <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other uh, better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also. On the things of others. So we have kind of this little first section that's broke off here, and uh, Paul says it's kind of a rhetorical statement. If there be any consolation in Christ, consolation also means like comfort, comfort or refreshing. Uh, probably have to go with refreshing since he also says comfort of love. If there be any of that stuff uh, in Christ or in our, you know, in our relationship with God, which obviously we know that stuff is there. There is refreshment. There is comfort in love. There's uh, mercies with God. We know that kind of stuff. So Paul's, you know, if there be that, which there is, he says, then fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So oh, here, I'm ask you something there. Go ahead. Now, are, now are they speaking to all churches? Is that what they're... Is, well, he's writing to the Philippians here, all the Christians in Philippi, but yes, this very much applies to us today as believers. So uh, very, very much so, very applicable. All, all, the, all the church epistles... Uh, in theory, are very applicable to all the churches because we're churches today too. Now, um, when you run into stuff like in Corinthians where you had a case of incest going on in the church, <laughs> we may not necessarily be dealing with the same issue that's going on, uh, but we also, Paul gives them uh, ways or rather instruction of how to correct that and how to deal with that, and that can transfer over to other problems that we would deal with today, but very much so. And so uh, when you get to verse 2, and he says, Fulfill my joy that you may be that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So we kind of we're kind of dealing with one of these verses we've dealt with several times throughout the church epistles, where the modernists will say, see, you gotta love everybody, you gotta love everybody, you gotta love everybody, you gotta be and but but Paul every time sets a precedent there, right? There he says, of one accord, of one mind. And so if if someone's mind is set fully bent on not um, holding to doctrine or being about doctrine of the book or anything like that, then it's hard to have that fellowship. We covered that a lot last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. And it's not about me being right versus Jeremy being wrong or Jeremy being right. Versus, it's about whether you hold the book up to be right and whether you hold doctrine to be true. That's literally, uh, and I say this quote all the time, that's literally keeping all 52 face up, even playing field. If you don't believe all the Bible or you don't believe doctrinally, you've got to worry about it too much. That's your that's your problem. That's your decision. You get to make that, but that does not, in turn, bind me to rub elbows and, and have you know revival meetings with you and all that stuff. If you're against this book, because this church, I mean, as far as I know, everybody in its entirety believes in the doctrines of the Bible. And when people begin to deviate from that, we have other clear scriptures, even written by Paul himself, on how to handle that stuff. I mean, there's the big one everyone overlooks. Paul says if a man professes to be a brother, and he's a fornicator, he's an adulterer, he's a, a drunkard, stuff like that. He gives this little list of stuff. He says not to even sit at the table with him. Don't even be around him. Don't even, and, and people don't, that they'll preach this side about that you uh, be like-minded, having the same love, and they'll leave off, you know, on that one accord, and they might leave out that one mind. They'll preach that side of it, but they won't address the other side, and it, and it never works. I mean, that you you can make the Bible inaccurate and contradicting when you begin to refuse to preach all of it, or when you begin to neglect parts of it, or you begin to leave stuff out. 
then you can make it contradict itself really quick. And then you see all these people, well, the Bible contradicts itself. It contradicts itself. Another cause of that, I give you guys all the time. I try to instruct you, try to instruct you. Rightly divide the thing. You've got to rightly divide. And if you don't rightly divide, I don't care what you say, it will contradict itself in terms of looking at different passages, especially when one's dealing with uh, Jews in a specific situation like Jews during the tribulation versus, you know, uh, trying to apply that to church age saints who ain't even here during the tribulation. Then you can make things start to contradict one another re re relatively quick. That's why Paul told Timothy, rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to divide it up and say, okay, it's for this, it's for this, it's this dispensation, it's for this group of people. And I know we share that all the time, that all the Bible may not be written for me, but all of it, or to me, but all of it is written for me. I, I'm getting better at getting it right. But all the Bible may not be written uh, to me, but all of it's written for me. And you've got to get that saying down because uh, if, if you're not a Jew tonight, there's some things that you ain't going to experience when tribulation times come, comes. You're, you're not going to be here unless you're post millennial or you're uh, post trib, and you think you're going to be here in the tribulation. I've told people all the time, more power to you. You want to be here for that? Have at it. But I'm not going to be here for that. Uh, scripturally, we know that tonight, but uh, you got to pay attention to that stuff because then the, the, these modernists will jump on these these verses, just one little verse, cherry pick it out of there, and say, uh, "You got to be uh, like minded. You got to same love, one accord, one mind." Well, one thing I've shared with you guys many of times is you cannot have unity without truth. The, you you can't have that. If there's no if there's no truth, there there can be no unity. And so, like I said, people are entitled to believe what they want. People are entitled to not think doctrine matters anymore. They're entitled to think that parts of this Bible isn't accurate and it's not all, you know, it's not all relative, relative and we don't need to pay. They're entitled to that. I'm talking about us as a church tonight. This is how your pastor will teach and lead this church, that we hold all of it to be true despite what the devil and his foes and God forsaken reprobates say about it. We're going to hold it to be true because we're called to trust God at the end of the day and it doesn't matter. You say, well, I don't understand all of it. That's a good thing to have tonight. You better be glad you don't understand all this book. And I'm going to give you another quote. I, I quote all the time Time, but uh, Ruckman said a guy asked him one time said what do you think about this passage script over, over here and he said you know, he kind of gave him a little vague response and he said well it sounds like you don't really understand it he said you're exactly right and he said don't that bother you when you don't understand some of the Bible he said not at all actually it kind of makes me rejoice and he said why is that he said because if I understood all of it I know someone just as dumb as me wrote it and there's a lot of truth to that if you understood all that you wouldn't be looking at a holy God a deity that's far above you or I you'd be looking at someone that's equal to you that's not nothing special and so that that's something good help encouragement to you to keep in your mind it ain't for you to understand all of it all the time that god give you some here and some there and you'll you'll go through life and one day you'll close your eyes in death and wake up in uh victory we know how the old hymn goes and all that and then you'll know all about it all by and by you'll know all about it up there uh but down here we just get bits and pieces on our walking with god and god opens up something to us shows us something gives us a little nugget here a little little gold coin there and we get to preach that and teach that and carry that with us and this and that but as far if, if you was able to know all of it man you like like Rutland said you'd be you know someone just as dumb as you wrote it and that's something you got to keep in mind and that's what the modernists do they want a bible that is dumbed down to our civilization they want it to be something that everybody can have while at the same time the devil using that we've been learning this a lot in church history the devil using that to draw people away from the gospel and draw people away from sound doctrine and, and get the church in absolute apostasy where it's at tonight. If you believe the Bible, you know Paul told Timothy, the time would come when they would not endure sound doctrine. How are you going to get there? You have to get away from doctrine. What gets you out of doctrine? Getting away from that book every time, 1,000%. No questions asked. That's all it's going to do. In order for you to get away from sound doctrine, you've got to get away from the book that contains sound doctrine. And I've showed you time and time and time and time again how all the modern versions dilute and altogether remove sound doctrine. Now, uh, and I always share this in the onset. I'm not saying someone can't get saved and have an NIV Bible. I'm not saying that. Tonight. Never, never, I would never say that. I would never dream of saying that. Just like the chick tracks. People get saved reading those little chick tracks all the time. And that's not a Bible. I'm aware of that. But if you want to grow as a Christian and you want to grow up in doctrine and you want to understand the mysteries of the Bible and all, you're going to have to get a book that has it in there in order for you to get that. You're not going to find it in the NIV where they make Jesus Christ a liar. You're not going to find it. And so you got to you got to put all those pieces together. It's not God can write salvation on a rock out there, kick it off on the edge of 215 Highway, and have someone walk up the ditch one day, look at that word, and get under conviction of the Holy Ghost and get saved. 
that, that's all it takes. But we have something beyond after we get saved to do, and that is to grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and in doctrine and in his word in order for us to do that. And, and, and what's the point to doing that? So the church functions the way it's supposed to. So, so people are discipled the way they're supposed to be. So youngins get to hear the truth versus all the, the hell that's thrown at them 24 hours a day in modernistic churches. That, 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 that's all the dividing lines there. You've got to get that. So absolutely, we should love one another. I'm dealing with us as a church tonight. We should love one another. We should do the best of our ability. And you're going to fail at it. I'm going to fail at it. But we still have to be of one mind, one accord, having the same love. And that love being Jesus Christ, that would be the love that we should have tonight. And look what he says in three, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. I mean, what a verse. And he jumps into it in four. He says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, these are two really good verses that help you to be a great church member and a great brother in Christ. We're dealing with all men tonight. Be a great brother in Christ to do your best to live those. Are you going to live up to it all the time? Probably not. There's probably going to come a time where something's going to come up and you've got something going on and you're, for whatever reason, in your flesh, you're going to feel it's a little bit more important and you're trying to tend to that. And this, I, I understand all that. Uh, but I, I, I want to get this from a different side tonight. I've not really said much in the way of this through the last few years, uh, but it's something I've personally dealt with and not really the brunt of it, but someone I'm very close to has dealt with. But you've got to be careful also if you're the one on the receiving end of this, not to try to abuse that to get out of people what you want out of them. And that's, that's kind of where I wanted to go with this tonight. I finally felt like the Lord gave me liberty. But this person I know in particular, they did everything for this other person, bent over backwards for them, ran all over creation for them if they needed it, dropped everything they was doing, trying to, trying to raise a family and do, I mean, do everything they could to help this person out. And, and one day it didn't get done in the time that the person was wanting it done. And this person lost their ever-loving mind, began to talk down, began to get loud over the phone and get upset and raise all kinds of cane. And look what, you want to guess what the person shared with the other person? These scriptures right here. I thought we were supposed to look, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others and things like that. And that's the side I'm going to give you tonight. If you're going to be one of the people that's going to say, well, you need to do for me because the scripture says, and you better watch your attitude. You better be appreciative for what's done for you. And you better realize that sometimes people just can't get to something. And, and, and I preach this with a lot of heat under my collar because it was very personal in my aspect. That's fine and dandy, but sometimes I'm going to fail you helping you out. Sometimes you're going to fail me helping me out, and that's just the way it is. You don't dare get help and get help and get help, in this case, from one person for years and years and years. And when it don't get done in the time you think it needs to be done, you get mean-spirited and hateful, and then turn around and use the Bible to try to justify yourself for doing that. That's not, you don't find that in Scripture. Well, everyone looked on, on, on the things of others, but if those people don't look on your things and you jump their case and you get mad and you get frustrated and you talk to them like a dog, that's not how it works tonight. And, 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 and inter interestingly enough, and I hope no one in here would be, you know, in this realm of where I'm talking, but a lot of times the people that use the Bible to do stuff like that, they're some of the most selfish people you ever met in your life. They won't do anything for anybody else. They're always looking out for number one and trying to use everybody else to get something for nothing. You better be careful of that stuff tonight. It ain't anybody in this church. Don't be looking around thinking, I wonder who he's talking about. It ain't nobody in this church. I promise you, it ain't nothing like that. But I'm just telling you tonight, there's, there's a flip side to that verse. That's a good verse for you and I to apply. Try to look on the things of others above yourself. Try to be willing to, and, and, and you'll see why Paul would put something like that here in the latter end of the chapter. Uh, probably goes further with it than any modern Christian in America today would, even myself included and you included tonight. Uh, but but that's a good verse to start applying. Them two verses, real good. If someone needs something, do your best to help them out. No matter how much you maybe don't like them or don't care for them or they upset you or they frustrate you. Paul doesn't put any of those little exclusions in there, any fine print. He says, look on the thing, look on others of, on the things of others, but every man or look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Esteem one another. Uh, lowliness of mind, esteem uh, others better than themselves. Hold people up better than you are, and that'll help you help them. And that's hard to do sometimes. I'm aware of that. And, and, and let me say this: I'm not telling you to not go out here and help people in the world. We as Christians, we know better than that. But you need to also take into context, Paul is dealing with Christians, dealing with a church. We're dealing with a church tonight. If you and I should be able to get one thing down, it would be trying to help out our fellow brethren in the church. Not at the neglect of people out here in the world. I'm not stating that. I'm telling you we should have this one down like riding a bicycle, brother. It should be almost instantaneously. Someone needs something, I'll do what I can. If I can't get to it, I'll say, hey, maybe I, I, I'll, I'll talk to someone see if I can get them to help you. I mean, I, I try to do that stuff for people. I couldn't tell 
day, the time since I've been pastoring, people have been looking for a place to go. And I've spent hours making phone calls from people I know that rent houses and this and that, trying to find. That, that's stuff I'm talking about. we got to be willing to do that stuff. If you've got time, help them. If you ain't got time, at least be up front and say, I ain't got time right now. If, if, you, need, if you find someone else, you, it might be quicker that way. But if, if they can't, let me know and I'll do it. I mean, just be up front. But uh, I wanted to give you the other side of that because we, we really like that three and four stuff when it's used for our benefit, and you need to be careful on how you use that to your benefit um, in, in terms of expecting people, and, and you have to do it now, and you have to do it the way I want you because it's me, and you're supposed to look on the things of me versus the thing of other, you, you, or things of yourself. You better be careful of that stuff. You better watch it. You better be careful is all I'm telling you, but be careful not to abuse this in, in, in that, that, that aspect tonight. Be very careful with it, and, but as a believer too, be very careful to try and do it, to try to apply it to your life and say, it ain't about me all the time. If, if people in churches, and this goes for every church from here to Timbuktu, if people in churches, 90% of the problems, if people could get that down right there, you wouldn't find many church problems today. Most church problems come from somebody thinking the, the church revolves around them, and it's all about them, and it's the way they want it, and if they didn't go their way, they're going to raise a thought, and all this stuff, and that's exactly what I'm talking about right there. You've got to be careful of that. You, I'm, I'm, I'm not preaching hypocritical. There's been many times things didn't go the way I wanted, and it frustrated me, hurt my feelings, made me mad, all kinds of stuff, brethren. But how you respond to that is a whole other aspect, and, and, and that's what we got to get down tonight. So uh, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So Paul's telling you to have a mind here that was also in Christ Jesus. So now it's time to buck up and pay attention because he's saying you, you have the ability to have the same mind that Christ had right here. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He's, given, he's going to give you a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he was and how well he brought himself down in, in, in contrast with verses 3 and 4 that we read. Made himself of no reputation and took upon himself, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And I'll deal with 9, 10, and 11 here shortly, but I, I want to give you the first four verses there. Paul's now giving you an application of picture. He says you need to not esteem, you need to esteem others higher than yourself. You need to look on the things of others more than your own things. And he immediately goes, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was the mind Christ Jesus had? Christ Jesus is the I am. He's always been before anybody else. He is part of the Trinity. It's Father, Son, Holy Ghost, not in a numerical order, but in the three-part being. They are all God tonight. And so the, the Son of God coming down in human flesh and bringing himself low and so low that he was willing to die the death of the cross. I was just up here talking about some stuff with Charlie before service started, and he was talking about Lord impressing on him a message on the cross and sort of a lot of details that people don't even have no idea uh, about at the cross. There's a lot more than just the passion of the Christ. So you got to get that down. Uh, and I said, you know, anytime you really come into uh, contact a lot of times with Christ's death, they always throw in something about the cross because Roman crucifixion is, was, and always will be the most brutal death you could suffer as a man, the way they did things, the way they operated. They literally had a science to this, brethren. I mean, down to scientific things of when to do what and how to do what to make your suffering that much worse and last that much longer. Yeah, you think about that, Shane. That, they, they got that down to a science, not just because they done it over a day or two. It was yeah. Many, many, many it, people. In, 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 in most simplistic form, it was how can we make them suffer the longest. <laughs> Plain and simple. That's it. And just like I wouldn't even go here, but just like I was sharing with Charlie, you know, and, and, and a lot of people know this one, but they usually went by and broke their legs on the cross yep. while they were still alive because they couldn't hold themselves up uh, when their legs were broke. And the whole point of that was because as long as they could pick themselves up, they could keep from drowning uh, their lungs out with, with the blood and all the fluid and all that. And, and so they'd go by and break their legs. So they, they hung there for hours, in some cases even days, like Dad said, and, and, and that wasn't enough. About the time it got kind of close to where they could probably just give up the ghost and be done, they, they gave them one whack across their legs so they couldn't hold themselves up and let them suffocate to death to finish it out. I mean, science. Not, not, and I'm not talking about science false, false is so-called. They studied. They, they said, if we do, and, and you know how they study, test subjects, guinea pigs, we're like our government. <laughs> Man, I don't know if I get banned for that. Uh, but, but that's what they do. They, 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 they take one, crucify, maybe try several different things. That one killed him too fast. Let's do this one. I mean, over this many amount of years, you figure out what's the best way and most effective way. And, and 
There you go, kind of like gun control. I mean, they got it down to a science, brethren. They, they know what's effective if they can take them out of your hand. Uh, that's, that's your little government insert for tonight, so just uh, buy a lot of guns and ammo and stock up, so I'm going to tell you. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm telling you right now, uh, he's given us a great picture tonight of how, how to be. We're, we're not the Son of God tonight. Amen, preacher. Amen. Amen. And he's saying if the Son of God can do that, then you need to learn to humble yourself as well. And, and he throws that in there. I, I give that to you all. You know, make himself obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. You always see that connected with Christ and his sacrifice a lot of times because they're trying to show you that he died the most gruesome death that could be uh, executed on, on another human being. Uh, verse 9, wherefore, I mean, these, these are good amen verses, the next few here. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of the things in heaven and things in earth and things yeah. under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Amen. it's not about you and I getting glory, but he's saying look at what happened because he did what he did and humbled himself. God exalted him. Now, you're not going to be exalted in terms of you're Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and you're the greatest things in sliced bread. But Jesus also did tell people, he who uh, exalts himself shall be abased, but he who brings himself down shall be exalted. It's almost a direct uh, correlation there. He was trying to tell you and I as individuals, if we'll humble ourselves, God will use us. Not, not exalted to, oh, the, the preacher, preacher Charlie's here and we need to roll out the red carpet and we need to give him everything we can. He's the greatest. Not that kind of exalting. The exalting of God using you, opening doors for you, and, and, and allowing you to spread the gospel like you should want to do as a believer or as a preacher, and especially as a preacher, <laughs> what you should want to do, that, that God would open doors for you. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I get it. I mean, any, any pastor at some point in time, he sort of uh, envies evangelism, right? I mean, you'll go through a spot, times of pastor and think, man, them evangelists got it made. They get to travel everywhere. They get to blow in, blow up, and blow out, and they ain't got to answer no problems. They just get to go to different churches, start all kinds of fires, leave and let the pastor put them out or, or deal with them when they... And, and, and every... I, I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, most pastors have, have envied evangelizing at some point. But on the flip side of that, you'll hear evangelists that travel year-round saying, I'd like to just stay in one place, and I'd like a pastor, and I'd like to build a church. So there, 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 there's different things in, 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 in all that. And I said all that to say this because for a long time, I, I, I thought, man, I'd really like to just evangelize. I don't really care for the traveling, but if I was traveling to preach the gospel, that wouldn't bother me too bad. So uh, I thought that for a long time, and it's like, man, if the Lord wanted me to do this... If I felt, you know, you know how we get, we get in our own minds and we think, I'm pretty sure God wants me to do this and the door doesn't open, the door doesn't open, the door doesn't open. And so then you get into a whole other wrestle. Well, am I doing something wrong? Have I got something in my life that's hindering me? Or maybe the, the, the genuine most, I mean, if you're trying to live the way you should, your genuine really basic probably in theory, right response would be God doesn't want you to evangelize, and so uh, it, 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 it's. But but I said all that because if you if you want to do something from for the Lord, whether it's evangelism or whether it's finding a church and pastor, whatever it is, or whether you're wanting to be a great soul winner by handing out chicks or whatever it is, you're going to have to start with this first part of the formula right here and humble yourself. You're going to have to let yourself be brought down. And made made less than everyone else. If you if, if you're willing to do that, God will use you. And that's why I've shared it a million times. And I ain't going to get into specifics, but I've seen people that felt like they was called to preach, felt like they should be preaching, evangelizing, pastoring, or something. But they had one thing missing. They couldn't keep themselves down here. And God slammed the doors shut time after time after time in people I've known personally, people I've heard about that, that I don't really know, but I've, I've heard lots of stories, not in, in name description, but you just hear that from a lot of preachers that's been doing this longer than I have. If there's one thing I've learned in, in the several years I've been going, it's the bigger your head gets, the further God tends to slam you down and close doors, and that, that there's a lot of truth to that. That I have to watch that. Jeremy would have to watch that as a teacher. Charlie would have to watch that. Gary would have to watch that. Some of you will have to watch that. Whatever you're doing for the Lord, the bigger you start feeling about yourself and getting a little bit big for your britches, God has this nice little pen that he's able to reach in there and poke and, and sort of deflate you a little bit and bring you down. I don't say that with arrogance. I don't say that with enjoyment for those that's happened, happened to. I, 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 another thing, I was listening to a preacher tonight, and he, 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 some people was trying to get him to, he had, had the press calling him about some people he'd been into it with, and they're wanting a statement because he knew him, him and that preacher kind of butted heads and this and that, and I bet you feel pretty good that he's in all this trouble. He said, I don't feel good about it at all, and I'm the same way. Anyone that feels like they've been called to preach, and they're trying to study, and they're trying to preach, to 
despite their faults or this and that, I don't wish bad upon nobody. I don't want them to have to get brought down to a low state by God in a negative way. I don't, I don't get some sick, sadistic pleasure out of that. I'm giving it for a warning call tonight. You better be careful with that stuff. And that's what Paul's saying. Listen, God exalted him because he humbled himself and abased himself. He can exalt you, not to be Jesus Christ, the greatest thing ever, uh, and, and, and be the Savior of the world. I mean, I met some preachers that think they're just about as good, or they are the Savior. I met people like that. But that's not the kind of exaltation that he's talking about. He's talking about using you, you being used of God, you being exalted in that sense. Now, we get to shout hallelujah and glory, glory to God and all that in those three verses because we see also something that correlates with what's going to happen when he says it will happen. They, every knee will bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And brethren, you should get a little bit of happy at verse 10 because he says at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under earth. That covers every base. <laughs> down under the earth, we know what's down there. Amen, preacher. Amen. That's hell. That's the demons. They see all these UFOs and all this and that. I, I, I might have shared this with you guys, but I just... Uh, it, it's fun as a saved person that, that, you know, it's not like I've attained and I know everything, but studying certain things for a while, some of those things end up coming out to me and I get to pull them out from what I've particularly been focusing on for a period of time. And I watched this UFO documentary on, uh, I think it was Tubi the other day, and uh, just kind of wanted to see what they said about it. I guess Congress or the Senate, somebody had actually had a physical big time meeting over this a while back and I didn't know about it. People were finally bending their arm like, listen, Enough's enough. You guys need to say yay yeah or nay. You've got stuff or you don't have stuff. And all. So I wanted to watch it. Was that the one where the pilots had actually testified? Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and, and I, you trust me, when I first got saved, I was still like, mm, UFOs and all that stuff. You, you're a whack job. But then I started studying the Bible. I was like, okay, there is some unidentified flying objects mentioned in the Bible that ain't nothing like we've ever seen here before. And, and then I started studying this deeper. And then you've got all these scriptures that are letting you know, okay, we're seeing stuff, but it ain't nothing to do with little green Martians flying around in outer space. Right. It's things from down under. Okay. And so when I watched the, uh, uh, that documentary, all the study I've been doing, it was, it was sort of uh, a moment of sweetness, I guess, or, or I don't know what you'd call it, just because I've been studying. And I get to, I get to keep hearing these unregenerate, un just lost, reprobate sinners in this documentary don't know Jesus Christ from a hole in the ground, man. They couldn't tell, you, kept, couldn't tell you the difference. But they kept saying, you know, one of the things we've been noticing is most of these UFOs we see, they're not actually starting out in outer space. They're coming up from out of the sea and, and then entering out into that realm. And I thought, you bet your bottom dollar they are. And, and so it was nice to sit back and be like, well, they don't even know what they're saying. And they're saying what God's been saying all along. And, and people, are, it, it's just, it ain't click. They're not saying. I don't hold them at fault for that, but it's just nice to see some validation from a lost and dying sinner that doesn't know the Lord say something that your Bible says that God already said, you know, 4,000, 3,000, some places, you know, that 6,000 years ago, things you see take place. You're talking about Genesis chapter 6, brethren. You're talking about, they, they, people always call them Nephilim, but it's the uh, fallen angels mixing with the daughters of men. And you've got, I mean, they, they stuff you can't explain unless you're willing to open your brain up and say. The triangle, maybe, some of them have decided to. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, read uh, Revelation 16 through 19, and it'll tell you what comes out of the ocean. Yeah. You know, we got beasts coming out of the ocean in the tribulation. Yep. You know, so, you know, you're, you're hitting it right on the head. And people, they're like, that, and I was like that for a long time, like, that's a bunch of made-up stuff we but it ain't, like I said, it ain't about, when, when you say UFOs, some people mean, well, that preacher's talking about green Martians. I'm not talking, I don't know what they look like. They're demonic, whatever they are. But I'm telling you right now, they stuff that you cannot explain. And God may just so happen have already laid it out <coughs> for you and give you an explanation. I, I've heard a few preachers, and I know Jeremy's heard this, and I think it would fit in real well with the way the world's been hit, going for the last umpteen years with Helly Weird and sci-fi and Marvel movies and all that stuff. All Marvel movies are. A lot of them is direct correlation to Greek gods and all that stuff. I mean, it, 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 any anytime your world or Helly Weird is very persistent in a movie or a, like, Mar how many movies was it in Marvel? I mean, 20s, 30s? I mean, gods of them. They've been doing this for 15 years or better, 20 years maybe. I don't remember. Uh, but... You're talking about a complete just push and push and push and push. And so I've heard, you know, quite a few preachers say this, and I, I can't prove it biblically. We don't necessarily know how that's going to go per se. But when the church leaves here, they're going to have to come up with an explanation for people to come to terms with why all these people just disappeared. They're going to have to figure something out. 
Well, lo and behold, it would just make good sense to me. Oh, there is life in outer space. They did come and take a bunch of, I mean, that may sound wacky to you, but brethren, that, that's not too far off the, 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 the course there of an, at least one of many explanations that could be give, given what we see all the time in Hollywood, and now we've got big government meetings, and now they're having to come forward, and you have, I don't know the, the time frame, and I went way off track here, but I don't know the time frame exactly, but I know UFO sightings were real big and real big and real big, and then you went like close to 20-some years and didn't really, everyone just laughed it off so much that nobody really talked about it anymore, and now all of a sudden it's bam, 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 back again, and now the government's fine. Used to the government, no, y'all need to shut up. That's not real. It's fake. They tried to debunk it, and now they're starting to address it. So uh, take it for what you well, want. I pilots I actually addressed it in front of Congress. Yeah. Yeah, they said we've seen stuff that you're talking stuff would be flying Describing. in immediately this way at hundreds and thousands of miles per hour. Well, I've seen stuff at night at the house. You're you know, in the sky, like lights that just show up and then boom, they're gone. Yeah. You know, and it, the sky is clear. And you say, you know, I'm, and I'm sure some of them people are crazy, whack job. I, I give you that. Some of them, you ain't gonna have all of them telling the truth. Some of them just want publicity. But at some point, out of the mouth of two or three more witnesses, let it be established. It's time to say, okay, something's going on. I don't know how I went into all that. Uh, it, it, it don't matter what you feel about it. I'm just telling you, there's places in the Bible, if you're studying it, you're going to have a hard time explaining it if you don't open your mind up to the fact that there may be something down under us a little bit more crazier than maybe even Hilly Weird makes it to be. And what it is is demonic. Go, go, go study the pyramids. Ain't no man can do that. There ain't no techno technology today. They say they don't even think they can do that with the technology. Yeah. Who did that? Someone with minds that were a little bit more enlightened than uh, I'm. You know, I wouldn't even plan on going here. I, <laughs> I, I just, I just try to get people to think about things a little bit. Black is beautiful. Well, I'm gonna tell you. If you ain't read that book, I'll, well, Cindy's got it right now, but uh, it helped you a little bit understand all that. Uh, one more thing. You got an organization called the CIA, and they don't answer to nobody. That's right. Nobody. <laughs> they get budgeted 20, 30, 40, 200 million dollars out of your back pocket, and they don't get, they don't answer to nobody. What are they doing with all that stuff? Uh, what was that old show, More on Unsolved Mysteries or something like that? Yeah. Gets it. yeah. <laughs> Sleepy Joe gets it. Ah, uh, where was I at there? Verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence? Here's a big one. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In the, uh, with fear and trembling. So we got we got to address this real quick. Uh, Jeremy sort of did the other day in, in passing. I don't remember what he was referencing. He didn't falsely teach it or nothing. But I, I couldn't tell you the people I've come across. And they come to something doctrinal, and they say, uh, you know, well, let every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. And that's not, that's not at all what that verse is telling you. It's talking about working your salvation out of you, like. Uh, God doing something inside of you and you working it out to the rest of the lost and dying world. It's not used in the context ever. It shouldn't be used in the context. Everybody uses it in where it's, well, we don't agree with doctrinal factual things like the virgin birth. So let's just say everybody work out their own salvation and God will deal with it. That's how you can't come to that conclusion or you're completely against 1500 other Bible verses that deal with doctrine regarding either the virgin birth or the fact of how you're saved and, and on and on and on and on it goes so uh and it's not about work out your salvation in terms of you work for your salvation it has nothing to do with it work it out out of what out of you out of your flesh your flesh is wicked sinful godless and you got to work that thing out because what god did is on the inside right circumcision of the heart that was done on the inside of you christ dwells in you. Amen. Paul said, there's two natures. I've got a new man and an old man. Makes good sense. I'm, I don't have all the scriptures wrote down right here in front of me to give you, but it's real simplistic teaching. That means the old man will be this bag of flesh that every time you get up or every time someone cuts you off in traffic or every time somebody shoots off the mouth, you want to ball your fist up and knock their teeth down the throat. Amen, preacher. Amen. And the new man that lives in you would be the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost of God in there saying, you can't ball up your fist and punch that man in the mouth because that's not the right thing to do. Now, I understand you get into self-defense. Don't, don't, no one twists my words. I get all that stuff, but I'm talking about just because someone rubs you the wrong way and you think, man, I'd like to plow your row for a minute or two. That's where you see the difference in the old man and the new man. That's when you get over in the book of Romans and Paul says, that is in me. 
In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The only good thing that dwells in you is inside of you, and that's what you've got to work out of you. There's this, this barrier flesh there. Some of y'all may be more pious. You may be more spiritual than me. I don't know about you, but there's days, brethren, I mean, it is literally that <coughs> in more round mentality for me to keep going because my flesh is just on me, on me, on me. Not even necessarily to go do something just wicked and godless like we would look at things wicked and godless. Look at Peter. Yeah. I mean, we all have that, you know, we we all we all have that in us to where like we want to like act in our flesh, but like you said, just one more round, you know, one more round, keep going, and just. And, and we going. all have our good days and our bad days. Yep. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Some days we get up and it's like you do it, don't think much, you jump in your Bible, you read for an hour or two or whatever, or you get home, you read for an hour or two, you pray without ceasing the best you can all day. No one, you know, more than likely you didn't really run into anybody, so you didn't really get mad at anybody. Your phone didn't go off from someone's going I mean, we, we have those days in there, but I'm trying to encourage you that you've got to work with that out of you. It's, it's, it's a work. That's why I said it's work. not a work so you can be <coughs> saved. It's a work in of the salvation that's in you, out of you, for everyone else. That I, I can't, I can't lead people to the Lord if I'm always healing, he, heeding, and yielding to the flesh. Because what that's going to do is someone might get punched, or they might get shot for no reason, or they might, you know, a fiddly reason, or they might get cussed at. If, I, if that's the kind of way I'm going to yield, and who I'm going to yield myself to is my flesh. I can't. Salvation never comes out of that. I don't get to witness to nobody, or if I do, it'll be done in mockery. People will think I'm a hypocritical idiot, which people think that anyway, but you, you just got to watch yourself and not full-blown hand my reason to say, yeah, I knew it, blah, 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 and, and that's just plain and simple. Wherefore, my bro wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You've got to work that out of you. You've got to allow the, the Christian work, the, the Christian should work out what God has worked in, if you want the quote. The Christian should work out what God has worked in you. It's not about, well, Jeremy don't really agree that Jesus Christ has always been God, but he was a begotten God, because that's a teaching you deal with today. I don't remember if that's, uh, I don't forget what, I forget what they call that. I don't think it's all millennialism or anything like that, but it, some people believe that. They don't think Jesus Christ was always God. He was a begotten God, and they, that's ignorant, unscriptural against doctrine. And so I say, well, you know what it said, Jeremy, you just work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The biggest one I already give you. Ella says, I don't, I'll, I'll get you just one second. Ella says, I don't believe that Jesus is born of a virgin. That's not where I come here and say, well, you know what Colton Philippians says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If you don't believe he was born of a virgin, brethren, you're still in your sins and you're damned for hell. That's right. Yep. Amen. Then he was just a man like you and I, <coughs> plain and simple. So that's why I'm trying to talk about doctrine, where that separates and draws lines in between things, and you don't always get to rub elbows with who sometimes you might feel inclined in your flesh to rub elbows with certain people, where you got to draw a line. Okay, either the Bible's right and they're wrong, or I want to deem the Bible wrong and they're right, and I can tell you which one's right. Go ahead, Ellis. I just wanted to ask if if I'm looking at this wrong, um, but I just wanted to ask where, you know, it said, you know, in that verse, it said, but now much more... Uh, or but now, not or uh, excuse me. But now much more in my absence, as in like that kind of thing of like how God puts us in a, you know, or a uh, when He puts us in the wilderness where like when He's we don't feel Him that He's there, so it's like we try to, is it like I said you're trying to, or the word said that. Um, I'm trying to explain it. Sorry, hold on. Well, I had it. I, I had it in my head. head. Paul is saying um, in his absence, meaning he's not there with them. He's writing them a letter. Okay. He's in prison right now. It's one of his prison epistles. He's saying in my absence, meaning I'm not there with you. Okay. So since I'm not there with you to help you with everything, and 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 hold your hand and walk you through everything, you need to work out your salvation. You need to work it out of here. Okay. You just need to work for the Lord. Uh, but you were headed towards times where we're kind of off in the middle of nothing and feel like maybe God ain't there or something along those yeah. lines, things like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not really applicable per se to that verse, but it's definitely a problem we struggle with where we feel like God's not there and stuff like that. You just keep walking. Just keep going. Okay. One more one more round. Really, that's all I know to say. That's going to be my lifetime pull from here on out. God bless you. Stay focused. That's yeah. the key. Paul, Paul was literally just saying, in my absence, meaning I'm not there with you guys. Okay. So... Uh, verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both, look here, to will and to do of his good pleasure. So now you have a little bit of an expounding on that verse. He's saying it's, it's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's allowing your salvation to do his will and work, do his good pleasure. It's, it's very self-explanatory, but 
you know, we get into this problem, and there's been times I'm sure you've been tempted, just like I have, or maybe not even necessarily tempted, but you just thought, I'm going to take that verse and run with it, and it's like, oh, wait, pump the brakes. I better, uh, that verse before it kind of plays into a factor. That verse after it kind of takes it a different direction than Shane was planning on taking it. And that's where you got to be careful, back to rightly dividing. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. I mean, like I said, a lot of this stuff is self-explanatory. Real simple. Do all things. Not not do half of it in the church. Not do a quarter of it. Not do 99.9% of it. Paul's, Paul's encouraging you and saying, do all things without murmurings and disputings. You, you relate that. How do I do that, preacher? You go all the way back to the beginning where he's saying, hold other men up and love yourselves and worry about... You know, and even more so, holding the Lord Jesus Christ up above yourself like you should be doing first and foremost. If something ain't the way you want it to be, that don't necessarily mean that God's not pleased with the way it's going to go now, even though it wasn't the way you want. And I've had to sit back and watch that myself. Some of you may have, and it's very hard as a man with our pride, and we think, well, I thought this, and I've, you know, I've done this. And we, we're real susceptible to getting to thinking that way real quick, and you better watch it or God will knock you down. I've, I've been there before. It's, uh, it's not fun. You know, Shane, real quick, though. You're fine. You know, go back to using all eight terminology the other night. Uh, as Christians, you know, all eight is good because he was conditioned. Mm -hmm. He stayed in shape. Great. And that's what we should do. Stay conditioned. And, and all these things are find a way through them. Yep. Same as being rooted, same concept. I mean, all that's, we've got all these analogies the Lord gives us in it, like fighting. If you're going to be a good fighter, you got to train. You ain't going to ride uh, in the Tour de France, and that's all you ever do, and then jump into a boxing ring, so I'm going to train for it their whole life, and more than likely you're not going to stand a chance with them. Right. Us as believers, same deal. That, that King James Bible, that's your speed bag. That, that chick tracks or church attendance or prayer, whatever you want to put there, that's your jump rope. I mean, that's stuff for you to keep training and endure. That's why... That's why, I don't know about you all, but me, one of my favorite verses in the Bible where Paul says, Spir uh, physical exercise profiteth little, but spiritual exercise profiteth much. I mean, some of y'all in the me, you corn fed, and you love that verse in the Bible because he says that physical exercise, yeah, it profits little. It's not as important as your exercise for the Lord. Well, exercise, training, that's what they conditioning. Same, same concept, you've got all that there. Um, but do, do all things without murmurings and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. Without rebuke, in the midst, look what he's, he's telling, telling you, not that you may be blameless before God. He's telling you who you need to be, that you may be blameless before who? That you may be blameless, blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And so now this is one of the hard verses, right? This is where we're called as a believer tonight to do what we can to do what? To have a good testimony. The best of our ability. Now you notice he says things like that you may be blameless. He didn't say you're always going to be blameless amongst people. I'm not talking about you physically doing something anyway because you're going to be blamed. But people's going to find something to accuse you of whether you did it or not despite what you do. If you're preaching this book or you're teaching this book or you're even, I'll venture to say this, not so bad. But if you're coming to this church, they're going to be people's going to find a fault with you. They're going to have something to say. They're going to have something to nitpick. And that goes for any church. And ain't just this one. People, oh, you go over to that church. Well, I heard this and I heard that. I mean, you're good. people's always going to have something to blame or to say. And I understand we live in a sissified, effeminate generation today where you bump somebody and they've got a bruise for six months. I'm aware of that. But it doesn't change what we've been called to do to try to be the best we can as blameless and harmless. The trouble you run into today, I'm very aware of this, but you start taking a stand like on the King James Bible. Well, now you're harmful. Now, now, you're, now you're hurting my feelings and I need a safe space. I can't believe y'all would be legalistic like that. I can't believe y'all would be so fair. See, I, I, I understand that. You, you got to understand how to divide there. You do things for God right with a good attitude, with a good spirit, and take your stand and if people's going to blame you or they're going to deem you harmful or they're going to deem you mean and, and hateful and all that, you can't do nothing about that. We're talking about getting out here and flat out wiping your testimony out because you're snorting dope, you're drinking liquor, you're fornicating, you're doing all this stuff. That's the kind of ignorance that has done more cause, more hurt, more harm to the cause of Christ than anything else ever. Yeah, I, I understand people always label it and say, you know, Pharisees in the church and hypocrites. Uh, well, they always say hypocrites, but Pharisees in the church and, and legalists, they do the most harm. I would disagree with that. I would disagree with that a thousand percent. People people get mad at someone because they're a legalist or a Pharisee. They'll typically pack up shop and go find somewhere else if they're saved and got the right spirit. 
But you find someone where the preacher's sleeping with the piano leader, the song leader, or he's doing something godless, just depraved thing like that, and that's where you find the people that say, I ain't been to church since I was 15 years old because when I was 15 years old, the pastor did this, and the pastor did that, and I was real close to being in one of them situations, not me sleeping with someone else. Felicia, that wasn't the case. But being under a pastor that was getting into the realm of all that, and, and, and it was only by the grace of God it didn't wipe me out because I could have been like the other 99% out there that have used that to stay away from church and stay away from Christianity and become an atheist and all that. But God had saved me, called me. I would, it didn't make a flip to me what brother so-and-so did. or so. Yeah, I think God should definitely jack slap them over the head and stuff like that. And he did and he will and they're going to give an account one day whether I'm, you know, whether it's up to me to testify or not, they're still going to give an account for it, uh, but but it ain't it ain't the legalists that are running everyone off like a lot of these uh, reformed people, so trying to sort of deconstructing the, those people, uh, uh, independent Baptists, that's why I left, because they're just legalists and all that, it, you're, you're dumb man, you ain't, I ain't got time to talk to you let's, let's worry about upholding you, you understand the flop there and it, it's, I understand people can go too extreme either direction you could be uh, what is it that always like an independent fundamental fundamental Baptist and be an absolute Pharisee, hateful, arrogant, prideful jerk. I'm aware of that. I've met them. I've been in contact with them. But on the flip side of that, you got to be real careful because there's a line there where you're talking about men that are trying to stand up for the truth of the Word of God and they're trying to do their best to present their bodies a living sacrifice like Romans chapter 12 verse 1 tells you to do. And they're doing their best to try to preach holiness to the congregation so that they'll live a life that is pleasing to the Lord so God will help them, bless them, and encourage them. And everything else the modern church is looking for, we've got it right here if they're just willing to submit to the book. And that's it. So you, you've got a little bit of a line there. I'm aware of that. But ultimately, what majority of the people are saying, the, the ones that are, what is that, Charlie, deconstructing their faith, ain't that what they call it, or reconstructing it? Deconstructing. Then, and you see the, you got that podcast on Spotify. I tried to listen to it for 10 minutes, man. I about went plumb vomit all over the place, the recovering fundamentalist and how they finally pulled out of the all the horrors and the terrors of an independent Baptist church. And blah, blah, blah. All on and on. Why don't we start worrying about preachers standing up for what's right and whether they're preaching the gospel and all that stuff and quit nitpicking. Well, they think they're better than everyone else because they wear a suit and tie or they think they're better than everyone else because they don't drink liquor. And they they're just trying to live wholly separated the best they can. It don't mean I live up to it 24 hours a day, but I'm doing my best to try to do what's pleasing to God and I'm doing my best to preach what the book says and I'm doing that for you all but more so than you all so your head don't get big. I'm doing it for all these little kids sitting in here amen. so that maybe, maybe, even if it's just one, they stay out of the gutter. Yeah, amen. amen. They don't realize that uh, who they're really fighting is Satan. They're working for. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. They don't realize it. So, I mean, to kind of add to that a little, I mean, you can be, take a road, for example, you can be in the ditch on either side of it. You can be way out here in the left ditch or you can be way out here in the right. We need to be right down the middle between, you know, somewhere at, you know, like I drive in both lanes. <laughs> I pay taxes for both sides. I'll drive on whatever side I don't want. I know what you're saying. Off the road, still in the ditch. Right. Don't I hit that sometimes the physically. My guy's about to beat around the other thing. Like earlier, you mentioned like as far as keeping your testimony this or you know in check. A lot of the people today don't even correlate that statement with like. I'll use him for an example because we all probably know his Philippians 4.13 deal. Like Tim Tebow. It's like Tony Hudson said. He does more playing foot, more against the Lord, playing football and advertising for alcohol and this and that on a Sunday than his Philippians 4.13 is ever going to read. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody ever pays attention to that because he's a good person. And, he's and, and that's the problem you run into with these recovering fundamentalists and people deconstructing their faith is well, you're, you're a sinner too and you mess up. It ain't about whether me, Charlie, or anybody messes up. It's about our faith and belief in this book, in it being right, and in it being the final authority. It's just like if Jeremy went out here and murdered somebody, and then he turned around in the next 10 years of his life, he went out telling people it was wrong to murder. They'd be like, oh, you're a hypocrite. No, there's still nothing wrong with Jeremy telling people they shouldn't murder. I mean, how stupid can you be? It's still good, sound truth. 
just because he's been guilty of it once or maybe multiple times. I don't know. If anyone on Facebook's curious to check him out. Uh, but whatever it is, we would, you wouldn't say, well, he don't need to be going and telling people they shouldn't kill people because he did it once. If anything, he's got more grounds and more justification to tell people why they shouldn't because he's done it and he knows the consequences of it, just like you and I was saying tonight. We know we've been there and done that. Kind of like raising a kid. We know that's why we're trying to tell him. I've been there and done. I'm trying to save you a lot of trouble. Same thing. But people don't care about that. And so that's why, yeah, you get in these verses in the modernists. Well, see, 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 there it is. There it is. No, it's, you're, you're missing the concept. It's about the Bible being the final authority. If you don't believe that, that's fine. Go kick rocks. Go go, go play spin the bottle. Whatever you want to do. I ain't got time to deal with it. But for us, at Little Song Baptist Church, it's this book. <coughs> believe it. It's true. From cover to cover. You say, well, I just don't. Well, you're just probably in the wrong place, brethren. I, I don't know what to tell you. They, like I always tell you, there's 14 other churches around that will give you everything you want and sugarcoat it for you and make you feel good. And you can go hold hands and skip down the road all you want and kick hands. I, I, it's America. Amen. Free, free country. you got freedom. Go do what you want. So far. And that's what, and, and I know I've took a lot of time tonight, but that's just what I don't understand about this generation. And I said this here a while back, and I probably don't need to come back to it, but it's like this. If you don't like it somewhere, you don't have to go there. Yep. Plain and simple. That, that, that's my philosophy on it all. If, I, if, I, if for some reason I wasn't pastoring next week, and I had to go find me a church, and I walked in there, and I thought, boy, I don't like that. Instead of getting up and raising a big stake and causing a problem spreading everything around town, I'd say, you know what? I'm out of there. I'm going to go try to find another one. Sort of like if I need a cake baked from a wedding and they won't bake it, I'll go find 15 other bakers that might do it. That's for any sin, any spiritual thing that takes place. But we've got this, this, this vendetta, and, and it's this generation where we feel like, well, if it don't go the way I want it, then I've got to raise a stake, and I've got to cause a problem, and it's going to be my way or the highway. Why? It's America. You got 15 million other places you go. What, wait, why waste your time with it? Because you want to cause problems. Because you enjoy the drama. Because you enjoy all the all the attention you get from it. And I know I'm sort of on a soapbox there, but it'd be good for you tonight. Don't ever let yourself get into that mentality. You go just like a husband and wife, man. You'd find 18 million reasons to divorce your wife and be justified in doing it. Maybe not scripturally, but from a social standpoint, uh, he was right, man. She never cooked biscuits. She burned them when she cooked them. She didn't. Uh, I mean, you can find 15. It don't mean it's right. Right. It don't mean it's okay. And so that's why you gotta. I don't know. There's Maybe a need, there's a need today to justify yourself based on your rejection. Back, back when we were saying that we want to be accepted, they don't accept us. Accepted by who? Who cares? I don't like you because you're pudgy and you're a preacher and you're white. I don't. Okay. <laughs> Why, why, why does everything just, I don't understand it. And I know that there's times I've struggled with feeling like I needed to do something to validify, validify myself in a situation. But you got to be careful with that stuff. Man, that's the world today. you got to accept the way we think. And it, no, I don't. Just like I don't expect you to accept the way I think. You want to die in your sins and you want to burn in hell? That's up to you, man. Free country. we got soldiers. we got people that fought and died for you to have that freedom. Do what you want. But... Instead, you see this desire, you got to accept us. You got i got bad news for you. If it's something that's against God, I will never accept it. That's right. You chop my head off, I guess, before I'll recant and say, I, hey, I accept it. I'm no. Pretty bold statement, but I don't know what else to do, brethren. Goes, like I said, we got a lot of people riding on this around here. Yeah. That goes Amen. hand in hand with the uh, people looking at us and every other King James only Bible-believing churches. Saying we're causing division. No, we were here. I mean, we've been here over 40 years. Work, for, you know, y'all with these new deals, that's the division. Yeah. Not us. They got shared that in the bulletin. You read all these testimonies of kids that load up and go to college, and immediately they're in classes like uh, scriptural uh, criticism, biblical criticism, and all these stuff where they literally immediately jump on the King James Bible. And you got droves and droves of infidels being produced by these Christian colleges that come out not believing the word of God. You tell me who's more divisive. You know what my statement is? You can believe God. How is that divisive? You say, well, we found all this other stuff. Good, they find all kinds of stuff all the time. Hey, man, preacher, <laughs> they, they don't mean nothing. People, stuff, get, stuff gets found all the time. And he's like, well, I've seen it. Yeah, you've seen it on the internet. I've seen a lot of stuff on the internet, too. And sometimes it's about threw me for a loop and made me scratch my head and think, man, that's pretty neat. And then you realize, oh, that's probably not even real because we have things like Photoshop. We have stuff can be manipulated so much today. It's either the Word of God or it's not. And that's all I tell people. It, it ain't, I know that people think, you know, we're big brawlers, and, we're, and, and it's not. If people come to this church, I've shared it many times. 
Sandy called me so they haven't visited the church. I said, listen, I'm going to be up front with you. We're King James only. We don't preach nothing else. But I wasn't hateful and said, if you don't like it, hit the road or don't even come by. I just said, I'm telling you up front so you know that. I'm not a brawler. I just want people to be aware of they get when they're getting into it. Amen. So plain and simple, it's, I, I try to be up front with people. I don't try to sneak them into something and, and get them. But all I'm telling you and all Jeremy tells you and Gary and Charlie and anyone else hit on this from time to time is you can believe God preserved his words. Yeah. How is that divisive? But instead, that's what we see today. It's flipped. We're the dividers. Mm -hmm. Because we stand for what? God's final authority? Yeah, you better go eat your bottle and suck on it before you go to bed. I know, yeah. <laughs> you have to understand. You've been waiting on that just, one all night. <laughs> they are just trying to better the church. Yeah. That's it. You've been waiting on that phrase all night, Dustin. About as much as the devil. No. Oh. <laughs> He, it was that you have to understand. He was one of I'm sorry. He's been waiting all night to say that to me. <laughs> we heard that about 75,000 times the other day from somebody. And you know what's funny? Actually, he's the one that needs to understand. I ain't going to give names, but now we're getting too drama fight up here. Dustin, I'll have to calm down. Ah, I got to read fast. I got so much ground to cover. Uh, did I, where was I at? 16. Oh, and look at 16. Lo and behold, here we've been. Dwayne brought us here kind of on the King James stuff. Holding forth the what? The word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You see what he says he's going to rejoice in Christ on that day? That he held forth the word of life. The book's alive. Amen? Amen. Amen. It is. The, the, the Holy Scriptures are called the word of life because they give life. They are alive. They came from life. They live forever. They tell of eternal life. you got five things right there to tell you why your Bible's alive today. It's interesting to me. We've done all this talking. He says that you hold forth the word of life. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, you, there you go. So you see, he talks about all this stuff, right? And, and I'll read a lot of the latter part pretty fast because it's just him talking about what he hopes will happen and what's to come. Uh, but he says things like, do all things without murmurings and disputing. Back up earlier in the chapter, he said, one mind, one accord. But look what he sort of ends that whole walking concept with here in this sort of break at 16 and 17. Holding forth the word of life. That's where your unity comes from. Bible truth. Bible doctrine. That, that, that's how you can... Do things without murmurings and disputings. That's how you can uh, get back up here. That's how you can be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. That's how you can uh, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem up. If, if you're a believer in that Bible and you're doing everything you can to try to live up to that Bible, and you ain't going to get it right every time, brethren. I don't know how else to tell you. You say you say that stuff, and it, you shouldn't tell people. I, I don't know how else to be, but to be honest with you, you're not going to live up to it all the time. You're going. No man lives up to even his own standards sometimes, and sometimes he yeah. drops the ball and he messes up. That's just the way it is. Don't know what else to tell you until you get on the glory and that flesh lays down and it goes back to the dust where it was formed from. You're going to fall short. You're going to mess up sometimes, but you got to hold forth that word of life and say, you know what? I may have messed up. I may I may have jacked around and, and, and dropped the ball here, but I'm going to pick this Bible up. I'm going to repent. I'm going to get it right with God, and then I'm going to hold forth that word of life, and I'm going to keep on trucking, man. That's what you got to do. So uh, I'll read through the rest of this pretty fast here. Uh, he, and, and, and there is some big stuff here, but I'll, I'll give it to you real fast. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Paul said, if I have to die... For your faith to make you stronger in the Lord, I rejoice in that. Remember how I said earlier we'd come across something Paul would say that probably myself and most people included don't know if we could go that far, willing to die to better someone else's walk with the Lord? Probably happens more than you know. People laying in a hospital bed, dying. Maybe they had someone that, you know, had a child that was saved when they was young and, and been, you know, backslidden, falling out on God and all that stuff. And that parent dies and it draws them back to the Lord and gives them a better stuff like that happens, brethren. And so uh, just, just some more self-attributes. Be willing to, like, you know, Paul gives us all this about uh, Christ bringing himself low. And Paul said, listen, if I'm offered on the sacrifice, service of your faith, I'll rejoice in it. I mean, that's, a, that's an attitude, brethren. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord to send you, Timothy, is shortly, shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your stays. And I want to know how y'all are doing, and it'll comfort me. He's going to send Tim Timothy, yes, Timmy, uh, Timothy. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your stays. As I got really no one else that will care for you naturally like Timmy will. Uh, Timothy, I keep saying Timmy, like Timothy will. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ or Jesus Christ. I mean, I... He, Surely y'all getting this preaching on yourself just from hearing the scripture, but there's where we're at today. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, 
that as a son, he's talking about Timothy, the proof of him, he's talking about Timothy, that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. Paul mentions a few times that he's, Timothy is his son of the faith. He, he is his son of the faith, son of the faith. Uh, him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me, but I trust in the Lord that I also myself, I also myself shall come shortly, yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier. Man, there's a, there's a fellow soldier word, Christian, militant Christianity. But your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Now we're going to read some real interesting stuff through the rest of this chapter. I'll say one thing and we'll be done. For he longed, he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. So uh, Epaphroditus was sick. For indeed, he was sick nigh unto death. And look what Paul says. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He's saying, God spared him, and he did that not, not just because he had mercy on him, but everything Paul being in prison, all the, you know, any kind of pastoral things he was dealing with, problems he was hearing about, or whatever, the death of another fellow soldier, another fellow servant, would have been another, that's why he says, sorrow upon sorrow. He already had things he was sorrowful, sorrowful for, and if he lost Epaphroditus, he was going to be even more sorrowful. And he says, I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service towards me. So, actually, i got to do things. I'm going to say this real fast. Paul was the greatest New Testament healer as far as you and I know it. Amen. 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 And here he's got a best friend, a fellow, or a, a fellow servant, fellow soldier, that's laid up sick about to die. I'm telling you this for a reason. Get you out of the charismatic room for a minute. Why didn't Paul, he said, well, he's in prison. Well, there's a good chance. I, I, I study Epaphroditus very much, but a lot of times they would get uh, permission to have visitors. So he could have either come and seen Paul, or if you remember Paul, at one point early in the ministry, in, in the early part, part of the apostolic ministry, they had handkerchiefs that Paul would pray and lay hands on, and they would send them to people and they would be healed. Why did he do that here? I'm leaving that question in your lap. You know my stance on it. Apostolic signs and wonders begins to fade out and the lights go dim there after the apostles begin to die or get in the latter years of their life before they die. So, you, like I said, you don't have to believe that in this church to be a part of our body. You don't have to believe that. But we ain't going to have healing services up here. We ain't going to be faking that stuff. I ain't interested in it. Now, if people want to come forward, anoint me with oil, pray over me, and they get healed, glory to God, hallelujah. But I'm not interested in the charismatic whack job stuff they got going on all over the country right now. If, if, if All I'm saying is this. Something changed. Everybody agree with me that much? Yep. It went from hotbed, laying hands on people, their shadows going over people, sending out handkerchiefs to people, guy falling out of the window because Paul been preaching too long about like I've been teaching tonight. Dude, old boy fell asleep, fell out the window, died. Paul goes up and lays hands on him, raised him from the dead. All these healings and stuff going ballistic. And all of a sudden you got Epaphroditus over here that's sick unto death. Paul can't do nothing for him. Uh, who else does he say? I forget his name. Someone else, he leaves somewhere. He said, I left him at such and such location sick. Why did he leave him? Why did he pray and say, sickness be gone? Because the apostolic signs and wonders were beginning to go out. And the, the lights were about to go out. Because we're not Jews, number one. We don't require a sign. And number two, we're not dealing with real life apostles now. Now I know you got a bunch of charismatics out there that call themselves apostles. But they've been on the end of a crack pipe for the last umpteen years now. And they need to get their head straight and read their Bible, plain and simple. Uh, because for the work of Christ, I wanted to give you 30. As I said, you may believe in all that stuff still. I don't believe God don't heal people, if that's what you're saying. God still heals people. Amen. But he don't use healers to do it like he did in the yeah. book of Acts. Amen. You say, I don't agree with that. You're entitled to the feeling. You say, well, I know someone that the preacher prayed over and they got healed. That's fine. I'll grant you that. I've seen I've seen Brother Ray Burr over here at First Baptist yeah. Church get, get hands laid on him and pray, and stage three or four uh, lymphoma, lymphoid cancer, right. gone. But I don't think it was my prayer praying that did it. I don't think it was anybody praying that did it. I think it was God hearing the prayers of, of saved people, beseeching the Lord like we're told to do in the book of James, well, laying hands on them, and he did it. Look at Jeremy and Kayla. Look at baby. Yeah. Doctor said it could. Doctor said it wouldn't happen unless they took medicine, and then she ends up pregnant before the medicine even gets into her body and takes effect. 
That wasn't because Shane was up here praying. Don't don't even ever try to put that on me. I don't like that movie. Don't put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. I don't want the Lord to try to be dead. It wasn't nothing I did. Amen. Amen. That that was God. Now I understand, but we're we're coming down to this thing. I try to pound in your brain, rightly dividing. If they did it way back here, why ain't they doing it at the latter end? All I'm asking. And you take it for what you want. You believe someone, you, you believe people have been, they've been caught too many times faking it for me to buy into it, number one. Yep. Amen. Amen. And number two, there's just too many scripture like this where it's like, okay, why didn't they just take Paul Hendricks just in there and him pray over it and they send it to Ephaphroditus and he's not sick unto death anymore. Hmm, maybe something's changed. That's a whole other subject for a whole other time. Y'all been through that with me for a while. I cover that. But you got to be careful because that is the big thing you see in our nation right now is this charismatic movement. You got people casting out demons. You got people raising people up from uh, growing toes and all this stuff. And people running around like, is it true? Is it not? Is it true? Is it not? I just try to take the Bible, lay it out there, and say, man, it happened in Acts. You get down here in the latter years of Paul, and you don't read nothing else about Peter and them boy, nothing. It never happened. And you've got physical accounts where he says, I left him over there sick. Epaphroditus was laid over here sick unto death. Paul, you was the greatest healer back in the book of Acts. What happened? Almost like that stuff was given primarily to Jews and the apostles specifically and there ain't apostles anymore now you take it for what you want uh, you want to go pay Benny Hinn seven thousand dollars or get your name put on a list or go ahead and smack you in the head I, I don't know how people do that you know they get what they want but they're not no, no glory to God it's no all a, that's why they get all the celebrity outpouring of it right and that's why they roll around in Armani suits versus my hundred and fifty dollar suit they wear six thousand dollar suits ten thousand dollar suits that's why they roll around in Bentleys uh, when I'm in a 97 Dodge Ram 1500. And it's not because I'm jealous. I'm just not going to get that kind of money at the expense of people hoping God's going to do something for them because I tell them that I've got the power to do it. Number one, that's borderline Catholicism, which you'd be interested to know that the Catholics and the Charismatics are getting pretty intertwined nowadays uh, because of the power they've got. I'm not interested in that. I just want y'all to have a book and be done with it, man. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. At the end of the day, that goes for me. That goes for your mama. That goes for everybody. Let God be yep. true. Let every man be a liar. Amen. At the end of the day, uh, if they're saying something contrary, if they're saying something that's not even in the Bible, like say they're just having a normal conversation with you about something, and it's not even any reference to the Bible, you still better watch it. I know how you fishermen do things. Amen. I'm get the wine back there, not giving a word. <laughs> Just conviction. <laughs> but look what he says. I'll finish with this. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. Not regarding his life to supply your lack of service towards me. Epaphroditus was willing to not give a rip about how bad off he was, how, how bad he was, whatever it is. And like I told you last Sunday, if you're sick at home with a fever and throwing up, stay away from me. I don't want it. I don't know what Epaphroditus' sickness was. I'm sure there's some church tradition floating around out there, but that's like anything else. You've got to take it for the grain of salt. Uh, I, we don't have any reason to believe something contagious. I, I don't, who knows what it was? But what I'm telling you is this. It's still that Paul trying to paint that attribute for you of you being willing to be a sacrifice for the Lord in terms of for others and do what you can. And I felt that, and you're going to feel that. But he said, he, he, for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. This dude literally on the brink of death. Didn't feel real good. But not regarding his life to supply your lack of service towards me to, to help the ministry out. So I ran real long tonight, I'm sure. But uh, anybody got a quick comment or anything they want to say? So. I'm oh, like 10 minutes over. Uh, All right, back to UFOs. <laughs> so we've.